uh, All right. Thank you. <laughs> may well succeed because this versatility economics permitting. Carl and I uh, have worked on a number of projects in Africa providing energy via solar panels and batteries to a number of locations, primarily, uh, but not exclusively for lighting. And we've got quite a bit of evidence that it makes a difference. There's an interesting study done at Columbia University a few years ago, where they took UN data on 48 less developed economies, uh, some 2.5 billion people, and studied the effects that increasing energy to those populations had on what one might loosely say the quality of life. And these are some of the uh, results that are in their paper. Again, that will be a reference in my paper, so you can get the original material if you'd like it. Made a difference everywhere, but the, the, the one I find interesting uh, is the decrease in infant mortality and the decrease correspondingly in birth rate. There is a positive correlation between energy consumption and decrease in birth rate. And there's also a correlation between decreased infant mortality and decrease in, uh, in birth rate. And this is uh, a, a chart contained in his, uh, oh, it's not where it ought to be. Now, how do I get that up further? There we go. There we, there we go. Got it. A uh, modest triumph. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, GDP per capita and energy per capita consumption, and those are about as closely correlated as you'll find in the real world. Yeah. <laughs> the place where uh, Carl and I have been doing uh, most of the projects that we've talked about a, a year or so ago is in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, right now, three out of every four people born on this planet are born in sub-Saharan Africa. And it is likely that by uh, the turn of the century, a third of the world's population will reside in, uh, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. One of the problems they have right now, they, they make extensive use of wood and charcoal, dung and biomass uh, as primary fuel for cooking and, uh, and for lighting. And uh, that of course causes deforestation. And as you see the Sahil moving south, uh, one of the reasons is that everything that's burnable gets taken up. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the per capita uh, energy use per year is 105 kilowatt hours, which is about what you would use to run your refrigerator. Uh, you can see what it is in India, and then you can see what it is here. About 800 million people in sub-Saharan Africa are without electricity, and those that have it, have it sporadically. Uh, a lot of the uh, systems there are inoperative because of failure to maintain them. Uh, there's a great lack of uh, trained personnel. We've flown over Africa many times at night, and uh, it really is a dark continent. So I think the first quote on here, if you ever done a C-section by a candlelight, came from Carl, yeah. who had that experience, I think, right? Yeah. Um, so the initial focus of the projects we worked on is, is to provide lighting. Carl realized a long time ago, before uh, I think most people, that if you had LED lights, uh, that was a sweet spot. 
you could provide a fair amount of light running off solar panels and, and uh, batteries. We expanded what we did in this village uh, to uh, to bring in some, some grinders. And this is one of the two grinders that are installed. It grinds maize, it grinds millet, dried cassava, and then the upper hopper, the one on the right, uh, will dehull rice. We found that uh, women and older children were spending something on the order of three hours a day to manually process these materials. And so now they, uh, they've got some, uh, some free time. The latest thing, and we just got word uh, uh, yesterday is that the uh, deep well pump for a well that they have uh, drilled uh, is in place and they now have water in the village uh, for, for the first time. We did an experiment last year using an interim pump, uh, tried to get them to try out drip irrigation during the dry season. Uh, the image on the right shows the results of that. So the very first time in this village, uh, they had vegetables and a lot of them uh, in the dry season. Why go through this? Well, it's because the population is expanding, both because of internal births and because they now have refugees from Angola and other countries due to one form of civil unrest or another. So we're going to try and expand this going forward now that the solar power deep well pump is in place and hopefully that will help. Right now they're just on the verge of malnutrition. The economists uh, says the situation in sub-Saharan Africa is dire. They need more energy. Uh, international financial institutions are restricting financing for fossil fuel generating projects, but they've got lots of coal and they've got lots of natural gas. So one way or another, they're going to use it. Ghana's finance minister in response said, is the West saying Africa should remain undeveloped? Sub-Saharan Africa needs energy now. Uh, it is likely if they don't get energy pretty quickly that the population is going to overshoot sustainability and a lot of people are going to die uh, as a consequence. To do this and to meet with other demands uh, for electricity is, um, is challenging. Worldwide demand for electricity today is on the order of 25 to 29,000 terawatt hours. Uh, a terawatt uh, is a million billion. So it's 10 to the 12th. And the, the guess is, particularly with the net zero 2050 policies in place, that uh, this could go as high as 71,000 terawatt hours by 2050. It's, it's not clear, by the way, that increased aspirations on the part of people in sub-Saharan Africa for more electricity is included in this. And it's clear that data center surging demands are not in this. Oops. Problem is that most of the means that we have to create electricity today worldwide, about 60% uh, are fossil fuel, coal uh, and, uh, and natural gas. The multinational agreement says we're going to replace all of that with primarily with renewables and primarily with wind and solar. And my argument to be made shortly is that you probably can't get there from here. This is what it looks like, uh, what the, um, and you can see that working from the bottom to the top, you've got coal, gas, you got oil, and you got nuclear, and everything else is a, is a much smaller fraction of total generating capacity. 
if we go with solar and wind, it places unprecedented demands on production of materials needed for solar panels and for wind turbines, particularly, but not exclusively copper, which is rightly named the middle of electrification. Financial Times, that's what FT means, said two or three years ago, green future is a resource intensive future. Missy and I were in an airport lounge, I think in Frankfurt, although I don't exactly remember. Uh, I picked up that copy of the Financial Times and uh, that's what started me on this quest to try and understand these material limitations. IEA is International Energy Agency and they also know that we're transitioning from a fossil intensive to a mineral intensive uh, energy system. This chart gives you some idea of the uh, resource intensive nature of um, why won't this go up? Let me see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Must be that I'm left-handed. It doesn't respond to left-handed people. <laughs> uh, at the top, you see the minerals uh, that are used in uh, in an electric car. Uh, it's an average. I mean, some use fewer, some uh, some more. And at the bottom, you see the use of particularly copper, which is in blue in a conventional car. It's about a factor of 10. Wow. I have an electric car, an Audi e-tron. Uh, the battery is 85 kilowatt hours and weighs about uh, 1,100 pounds. If you transfer uh, energy in kilowatt hours to gasoline, a gallon of gas will produce between 30 and 35 uh, kilowatt hours. So by that reckoning, I'm getting about 70 miles to the gallon. Uh, we have a charging port where, where the car stays under our, our portico in front of the house. And I must say it's lovely not to line up at a gas station. <laughs> On the right, we're looking at uh, offshore wind, which increasingly is beginning to uh, be the preferred location for wind turbines. And it notes that uh, per megawatt, you need 8,000 kilograms of copper or about eight metric tons of copper. And it can be a lot more depending upon uh, the particular size of the, and uh, make of the turbine. Installing all of these turbines and solar panels, which use a fair amount of copper for the wiring, uh, is depleting known copper reserves well beyond historic norms. The projection looking uh, ahead a few years is between 50 and 55 uh, million metric tons. And one uh, source noted that that's more than all the copper that's been consumed in the world between 1900 and 2021. Uh, if we continue to consume what we can get to, it's a poor legacy for our, uh, for our uh, yeah. descendants. Uh, the Economist had an interesting article last year uh, talking about how countries have, how many countries have committed to meet the net zero targets. And according to the Energy Transitions Commission, it's amazing the number of commissions and institutes and what have you that have grown up around, uh, around this. You need 15 times today's installed wind power, 25 times more solar, need to triple at least the grid and have 60 times more electric vehicles. You can do the arithmetic and take a look at what that means for, uh, for copper. This is one uh, outfit, S&P Global, that keeps track of commodity prices and commodity uh, factors that influence commodity availability. 
and they show us running out uh, roughly uh, around 2050. Others say there's going to be a shortage uh, just in the next few years. Uh, Forbes has written extensively on a lot of these resource issues. One quote is that uh, uh, to move from 25 metric uh, uh, million metric tons today to 50 be the equivalent of opening up uh, a new tier one mine. That's a mine that produces a minimum of 300,000 tons a year uh, for the next 25 years. And, that, that's probably not going to happen. Uh, there are a whole bunch of reasons why that's probably not going to happen. Uh, notably, that it's very unlikely that new mines will be opened. Uh, quality of ore is declining. In the 1950s, you get about 5% uh, gauge, 5% copper metal uh, in, in the copper ore. Now it's down to three tenths of 1%. And because the ore in these mines, since the low hanging fruit is mostly gone, uh, are heavily covered in overburden in, in a taking, in addition to taking out the uh, 333 tons of ore to get a ton of copper, you have to take out 1,332 tons of overburden. CapEx has gone from 4,000 a ton in 2000 to 44,000 a ton now. So that means a mine has got to be a pretty good bet before you're going to try and develop it. And there's got to be uh, demand at the price you would have to charge. Sites are remote, oftentimes uh, no roads. Uh, no utilities, no housing, so you got to put all that in, and that's what drives the cost up. And then, of course, there's a the shortage of engineers and workers. I note that one ton of copper does about 11 EVs. Uh, you may recall that uh, at uh, uh, COP28, I think I've got the numbers here, um, a number of um, countries signed on to uh, increasing uh, the installed base of renewables uh, by uh, 2030 to 11,000 gigawatts. That's of course substantially more than what's there now. So that's uh, that says they're gonna have to be uh, installing uh, about a uh, thousand gigawatts per year uh, up through 2030. So I ran some numbers just for fun to say, well, how much stuff am I going to have to remove to, to hit a gigawatt? We don't know what these countries are going to do. Some may use hydro if they have uh, capability to do that, have the geometry or the, the geography that uh, lets them do it. Uh, but I assume that half of it would be solar, uh, land-based solar. A quarter would be offshore wind, and a quarter would be onshore wind. And I calculated that um, they would have to move um, around the world um, something like seven uh, seven thousand. Uh, times 10 to the six tons of material. That's seven, seven billion tons of material uh, per year. So you can't get there from here. I think my numbers are probably pretty good, but- uh, This is really depressing. <laughs> it is. Well, just wait a minute, okay. just wait a minute. It gets better, not totally but there's serious. light at the end of the tunnel. There's light, we're getting there. <laughs> but it is depressing. Uh, then there's a question, are we running out of copper? You got to really be careful when you talk about running out of a resource because invariably uh, somebody at some price will find something. So there's plenty of copper in the Earth's crust, plenty of a lot of other things in the Earth's crust. The question is, will environmental, uh, political, and economic 
constraints be such that you choose not to go after it. So there's a great paper uh, written in 2018, and they included recycling. Uh, they included increased aspirations on the part of places like Sub-Saharan Africa, concluded that uh, likely run out by the 2080s, certainly by the turn of the century. So that paper, again, is, is referenced in my paper, which you will get if you want it. And uh, you can look it up and read it for yourself. I found it to be a very good piece of work. So if we're running out of copper, what do we do? Well, uh, we can pick up nodules off the sea floor. And this is what the... Uh, what am I not doing? Uh, here, I, no, it's I'm using my right hand now. <laughs> my fingertips are not anymore. I don't know. That's, that's what one of these uh, nodules looks like. So you find copper, you find manganese, you find rare earth elements, all kinds of things in there. Uh, estimates are that it's in the, you know, the billions of tons. Uh, where are these? <laughs> Where are they found? Well, lots of places. Uh, Emily noted uh, in a conversation we had, I guess it was yesterday, that the Cook Islands, which are up northeast of um, Australia, have uh, declared that they are going to open their uh, exclusive economic zone, which of course goes 200 nautical miles off the coast uh, to mining or at least to people proposing to buy, and they'll dicker over the price. The interesting thing is the Cook Islands are 15 islands spread over 2 million square miles of territory. So if you run the exclusive economic zones out for each of those 15 islands, you're taking in a big chunk of seafloor. The question, of course, is what is going to happen to the seafloor and uh, to the ecosystems uh, that uh, are in these in these waters. Uh, the mining techniques uh, just go through like a harvester and scoop these things up and destroy everything that's mm -hmm. down there. And they perhaps even worse, uh, sediment is released into the water column. And the effect of that on sea life is uh, essentially unknown. Uh, M as a colleague at the uh, World Economic Forum is looking into this, and I look forward to uh, uh, getting their report. Uh, there is the International Seabed Authority. They're supposed to sign off on uh, on grants in what's loosely called the commons, but they don't uh, affect what uh, places like the Cook Islands and other island republics uh, can do. There is another option. And I didn't take it out of my briefcase, but I will now because it's worth, <laughs> worth saying. Now we're getting into, getting into space. We're getting into space. <laughs> outer, outer space. Outer space. I'm sure. I know he knows them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. What you have here is a chunk of an asteroid. I'm uh, happy to let you pass it around. This is, almost, this is almost pure iron. And I guarantee you, this is the oldest thing you will ever have. It goes back 4.6 billion years and was created as part of the creation of the, of the solar system. Did everybody get that? 4.6 billion years old? So you all now have a new claim to fame. You have handled one of the oldest things that yeah. We're exist. passing around a piece, a chunk of asteroid, for those of you who aren't here with us. <laughs> I'm sorry I can't give you a virtual asteroid. But, uh, so there's a lot of material out there, uh, vast amounts, almost beyond imagining. The difficulty is it's not easy to get to. Mm -hmm. So you've heard the expression patient capital. 
this is going to require really patient capital because it will be years before you get a return and a tremendous amount of money to go into it. My guess is that in 50 years or so, this will be a resource that we will use. By the way, there's water out there in asteroids. And the reason, not in liquid form, but mineralized, and the reason that's important is that you uh, can get hydrogen and oxygen, and that's prime rocket fuel. So you can begin to refuel rockets, which means that the payload lifted off from Earth is uh, a whole lot less. There's also uh, a fair amount of water, we think, on the moon. Hopefully, within the next five years, we'll have a better handle on that. Here we go. We want everybody to see you. So this is the only picture of me that I will bore you with. On the left, you see the New, the, uh, new Shepard rocket that uh, took me to space. Actually, this on the left is an artist's representation because nobody was up there with a camera. And you see the capsule having been disconnected from the rocket. Uh, you see the Earth behind me. And you see, if you look closely, a thin blue line, like the one in the artist's representation, but to scale, that's the breathable atmosphere. So the thing that impresses you when you look out, and what it's impresses that you more line, right? after it's... you've been back for a while, is uh, the fact that the Earth is limited. We're limited in the resources that we can extract. And the closer we get to the limits, uh, the uh, more the environmental consequences. Wow. I can remember when, you know, the Grand Banks off Newfoundland had millions of cod. Now you have hardly none. Uh, Agriculture gets to be kind of interesting because with increasing populations, you're going to need uh, more food. And the problem is, if you look at the allocation of land for agriculture, it's skewed heavily toward cattle, sheep, goats, and such. So there's some interesting numbers on that. Um, 29% of the Earth's surface is land. 71% of 29% is habitable land. And 50% of habitable land is agricultural land. Of the agricultural land, 77% is for livestock, from which we only get 18% of the calories and 23% for crops that give us 83% of the calories. So uh, with increasing population, the uh, default option typically is cut down more forests. And uh, since we're trying to increase the amount of trees for carbon capture, uh, that's kind of a bankrupt policy. So I won't go into what you can do in, to get meat and milk and such, but would we'll refer you to a book called Dinner on Mars, written by two agronomists from Canada. Absolutely fascinating about how you, I mean, when you think about it, meat and milk are just chemicals. So you figure out what chemicals are there, put them together in the right way, you can produce meat and textured meat, and you can produce milk. And they go through a great explanation about uh, the technology in use today that suggests we can be able to do that, but it takes uh, less energy. So I'm going to argue there are limits to solar and wind. And if I had uh, more time, I would talk about um, intermittency, power density, cost of electricity, and reliability. But I will just I think we'll talk about, <laughs> yeah, about the copper amount. Intermittency is because the uh, sun doesn't always shine, and the amount of insulation that you get is a function not only of where you live and whether it's cloudy or not, but also the seasons. 
So this is about our latitude, 38 degrees north. And it suggests uh, what you might get in uh, watts per square meter over time. And if you want to watch something like this unfold in real time, uh, the Louisville Gas and Electric Company, which provides us with our electricity, has a 10 megawatt solar farm uh, about 50 miles away from us, sits on 50 acres. They're going to expand it to uh, uh, 100 megawatts, they say. And you can watch on their website moment to moment uh, how the solar farm reacts to that, what you're actually getting out. So the trick is to know that when somebody says we have added so many megawatts or so many gigawatts of solar power or wind power, it ain't what you think. What they're doing is reading the numbers off the base plate that says under ideal situations, probably never to be experienced, you will get whatever the base plate says, you know, 250 watts or what have you. In reality, you get maybe 20 or 30% of that. So you have to be very, very careful. And, and that uh, is measured by something, what you really get is called the capacity factor. And it's what you get over some period of time versus what the nameplate says you ought to get over that period of time. It's a percentage of uh, of nameplate value. Same for wind. Wind is tricky because it takes up an awful lot more land than a comparable solar farm that is with the same output. Uh, because you can't have wind turbines close together, they will shadow one another. And wind taken up by one uh, will keep a nearby turbine from getting much wind at all, if any. So they have to be spaced pretty far apart. Uh, the thing, though, to know is that about 90% of the land in a onshore wind farm can be used for other purposes, like, if you'll pardon the expression, grazing cattle or raising crops. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are things like that that you need to worry about or, or think about. This is... Uh, an interesting chart. It's uh, uh, sorry. Here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there now. Now this is one of the best charts I've got. Uh, just That's why it's not working. Click in the white space. Don't just it. That's what it's white Click in the white space. Yeah. Click here. Let's click. Click in the. Yeah. There we go. There All there right. Go. right. There we go. So uh, Germany right now has installed on land uh, something like 80 gigawatts of solar power. And if you fly into any of the major German airports, you look down and they're everywhere. Uh, this, the uh, bottom part of this in deep blue, uh, is the capacity factor. That's a percentage of the output given by the base plates that you're actually getting. And over here on a November day, uh, they're getting 3% of, so of, of 80 gigawatts. And I used to have a project in Germany. I was over there a lot outside of Stuttgart. And uh, you can see if you have cloudy day after cloudy day, why the Germans invaded France. They wanted to get out down into the Mediterranean. Uh, but this is this is uh, the best example I have, real world data of, um, of the problem of, uh, of uh, intermittency. Power density uh, is how many watts per square meter do you get from your installation, whether it's solar, wind, or something else? And that takes into uh, in that takes us into the issue of land use. Uh, a lot of projects are stopped because they take up too much land, and it's hard to tell how that's going to play out. Then, of course, there's the cost of electricity uh, and the reliability. Uh, this is an interesting. 
uh, chart that appeared in the uh, I keep getting the wrong thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then, there we go. This was in the Wall Street Journal a uh, couple of weeks ago, and it shows average price of electricity. And you note that as we have gone into uh, heavily on renewables, the price has gone up. And uh, there are lots of reasons why prices fluctuate. But I found this to be a very compelling chart and it had a good article with it. Reliability uh, comes into this. And that's because if you got a lot of solar and wind and it's intermittent, then you need backup power, typically gas turbines, sometimes uh, fossil fuel plants that either burn natural gas or coal. And it's expensive to have that backup. Backup power, when you really need it, can be in the tens of thousands of dollars per megawatt hour, as opposed to the hundreds of dollars per megawatt hour when you don't need it badly. I had a lot to say about that, but don't have time yeah, to say we're it. Getting well close so we got to get to space. So yeah, there's a, there's a space. bank robber in the 1950s named Willie Sutton. And you can look up Willie and Google. He was quite a character, apparently. Uh, broke, broke jail three times. Uh, and he ended up before the same judge, I think either the second or third time he was up for charges. And the judge was couldn't understand why Willie kept robbing banks. And so he turned to Willie and he said, Willie, why do you keep robbing banks? And Willie said, sort of surprised the judge didn't know. That's where the money is. <laughs> and why would that go someplace else? Okay, so the Willie Sutton option says space is where the energy is, and that's where you go to get some. And how do you do it? Uh, you, you put huge solar collectors in space, and uh, Peter Glazer, who was with Arthur D. Little up in Cambridge, Mass., uh, actually got a patent on this in 1973. concept is, as yeah. I say, fairly simple. Uh, you put tens of kilometers worth of solar cells up there. Uh, you transform the electricity from the solar cells into microwaves. You beam it down, collect it, and stick it on the grid. And um, this is kind of what one looks like. And uh, I, I really don't have time to go through this diagram, but the important thing is to note in the lower right, the size of these satellites uh, between the, uh, the, the, uh, our, the ends of the hourglass in the middle, uh, 1,700 meters. That's, you know, well over a mile. What makes this possible is that you're doing it in zero G. You don't have any gravity to worry about, so your structures can be remarkably lightweight and depending upon the design you adopt, the structures can even flex and you then correct with algorithms for that flexure to make sure that all of the energy goes where you want it. <laughs> So what do you get? Well, you get consistent, reliable base load power. The sun always shines up there. You get somewhere between two and five gigawatts per satellite. You can have more if you want it. Uh, it's dispatchable. So you can instantaneously redirect power from one user to another, depending upon load requirements. And you can split the output so you can simultaneously serve multiple users. That's pretty cool. And we think it's it's pretty cost competitive, but nobody's built one, so we don't know. Why now? Oh, I just don't have the touch. Uh, I'm here. In, uh, in the seven, 1970s, the weight of these things would have been on the order of 50,000 
metric tons. That's what T-O-N-N-E is. I finally figured that out. That's a metric ton. Uh, and on the right, you've got uh, English tons. Doesn't make any difference. They're very close to the same, a factor of 1.1 apart. So the weight to get uh, your uh, energy is in orbit is a whole lot less. Uh, the key thing is the cost to lift materials up there to, to build it. And I didn't mention it, but the rocket that I was on was on its sixth flight. So it comes back, it gets refurbished, and it's ready to go again. And uh, I think the record now for reuse held by SpaceX is something like 16, maybe 18 flights. Uh, it has to be authorized by, I think it's the FAA, so right. probably do more, but it'll take time for the bureaucratic grist to grind. Uh, Early on, they were going to have a lot of people up there in orbit doing the assembly. Now it will be done mostly in factories on Earth. You'll have modules. They'll go up like Legos. You click them together. Robots will do the clicking, and uh, and you're good to go. I mentioned this space lift is uh, is a big problem. Uh, this is some idea of, uh, by Citibank of um, how cost is going to come down. So the guess is that uh, in five to 10 years, we'll be talking about something in the order of a few hundred dollars per kilogram. So if you want to calculate your weight in kilograms, multiply by 200 and you can go up into space. You know, somebody would be happy to then to take your money and give you a, give you a trip into orbit. And this is uh, the estimate of uh, what electricity might cost from a whole bunch of sources. Uh, this is from a uh, startup claiming to put up a, a, a small satellite to do feasibility demonstration in 2027. It's called Virtus, V-I-R-T-U-S, Solus. You can look them up. But they claim that uh, down there at the very bottom that uh, solar-based power is going to be very competitive. We'll see. It's compelling enough, so if you just don't do any better than break even, uh, you'll be in pretty good shape. So bottom line is, if you want to help people out of poverty, if you want to reduce the birth rate, you give them energy. And if you've got a lot of energy, you can do a whole bunch of things, including desalination. Uh, I was going to talk about that, but but uh, yeah. didn't have time. You can also uh, produce methanol or ethanol and use that in lieu of burning charcoal or wood. And there are projects doing that right now in Africa, but uh, they're moving very slowly because the energy is expensive. So I'll close with... Do uh, you want me to push it up? A lot of people, uh, Greta Thunberg, the L'Enfant Terrible, quoted up there at the beginning, says we've been on a... Uh, uh, or not in the beginning, the next quote says we've been on a resource spree, time to call it a halt. Uh, other people, the economist uh, in Barcelona uh, says we're faced with an existential crisis. Uh, since this is, uh, has lots of people listening in, I won't use the words I normally use to describe that description of where we are. Uh, zero growth is really a bad idea. That would mean, for example, that Carl and I have to go into that village in Africa and say, look around because this is all you're going to get. You're not ever going to be able to improve yourself. <clears throat> I take a, a more optimistic view. Uh, this is from Tennyson's uh, great poem called Loxley Hall, which was, it's a piece of it, was written in 1835. He probably wrote it a couple of years earlier. But keep in mind the Montgolfiers first lifted people and animals off the surface of the earth in 1783. 
And here's Tennyson coming up with a vision. He could have written it today. So how do you make it a reality? Um, you take advantage of low cost to orbit and um, you, you begin to develop a space commerce. And there's a group starting up at the University of Kentucky. I hope to be part of the, of the group. Uh, trying to figure out how you get space commerce started. And I think I know how it could be done. Uh, let's see if I got it in here. Guess I don't have it. Thought I had it. Um, in uh, solar power, uh, uh, space based solar power satellites, you have a need for materials. And initially those are gonna come from Earth. They can come from the from moon. And so eventually you'll contract with Lunar Fabricators Inc. and you'll be getting materials from, from the moon. We, we think the resources are there, but until we put people up there and actually do detailed uh, surveys, we won't quite know what is there that we might make use of. But my guess is, that's how you get it started. And we'll see when we begin to do the numbers over the next year or so, if it makes sense. That's what the moon looks like. Surface of the moon and, and the earth seen from it. That was taken from uh, Apollo 8 uh, in uh, December of 1968, signed by, uh, by Frank Borman. I photographed that in our back hall. I've got autographs of all the Apollo astronauts and a whole bunch of people who worked on the technical side of it. Missy let me have all the space in the back hall up to the third floor. So <laughs> we've even got things that were actually on the surface of the moon. I've got three items that actually landed. So that's kind of neat. Um, so that's it. I think there was a great future in using space resources to get rid of uh, fossil powered electric generating systems. Uh, I think it's part of a mixed strategy. Uh, in diversity of sources, you, you have uh, resilience to uh, disruption. So I think you have lots of things. You have solar and wind, you have hydro. We have more hydro, by the way, now in the US than we have solar and wind combined. Grand Coulee Dam, if any of you are interested, is seven gigawatts when it's running uh, at, at, at uh, full capacity. The problem with hydro right now is uh, in a lot of places, you don't have the water. So there's a big plant at Lake Kariba in Zambia. We were in there a couple of times and uh, provides 30% uh, of the power for Zambia, and it's down now to almost zero, yeah. just like a water. Clint, I hate to interrupt, but we're a little over time. Do you mind if we stop sharing? Let's see if I can figure out how to do that. We didn't couldn't figure it out last time. I don't know. Um, I guess we'll just speak. I can't thank you enough. I think, you know, we've got some work to do to find out how we can, speaking of sharing, share and how this would equitably work in the world that we live in. But, um, but it's, you know, it, it's definitely, a, you know, out of the box, I guess. I don't know how much of a possibility it is, but uh, but I think it's the, this kind of thinking that we've all got to be doing to uh, honor the earth and the people on it. And we can't thank you enough for being with us. Um, Not just for being with us, for thinking this way. For thinking this way. Again. Yes, we, we need people who are thinking this way. Exactly. We really do. Well, I think because, of, I mean, think, think of, about it this way. If people had agreed with Lord Kelvin in the 1880s that science is as far as we're ever going to go. <laughs> yes, exactly. Then we had the 20th century. So yeah, Exactly. A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of things uh, now have fallen into forward. place, I think. Yeah. yeah, well, but, yeah. but we got to do the numbers and we'll be working on it over the next year or so. But, uh, well, please, I, I'm optimistic please at it. Yeah, please do. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yes, you want one, 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 one
say that works and we get electricity from the sun, right? Transferred and all that stuff. But we still need copper and they go precious. Oh, we do. But yes, we but, do. But, this but is not not know, nearly right, as much. Right. Oh, sources. and we still need to do alternative work. Yes. But right. yes. resources are still depleting. Yes. Now, yes. I'm just thinking in terms of space resources on this, we have successfully landed spacecraft on comets and even asteroids before. Yeah. I mean, yes. this is a terrible idea in my opinion, but has there been conversation about bringing them closer to Earth orbit and mining from them? Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Uh, there's yeah. a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot out there. How, and... how, how you do it is, is, um, is, is quite a question. People have talked, for example, about moving asteroids into orbit around Earth. Uh, pretty scary. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I can, wow. You know, it, 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 it's certainly technically feasible to the extent we understand the problems. Putting it around the moon is probably better uh, than putting it around the Earth because if you have a mishap, uh, better to happen to the moon than happen to yeah. uh, to Earth. Dinosaurs would uh, be happy to vote to put it around the moon. Yes, they would. <laughs> Given that, we're pretty sure that's how they got exterminated. Right? Oh my goodness! Yeah, yeah. that. Uh, yeah, that was that was huge. Yeah. yeah. Should we leave information will... with Clinton? We'd like his Yes, paper? please. Yeah. Let let Clinton know send, if you, send me a, you would send like me an email. Or... Or send an email. I'll I can facilitate that. You can contact me, and we'll make sure that he gets it. Um, I really thank everybody so much. Next week, we ha also have a <laughs> lost the audio. I think they're gone completely. Too bad. <laughs>